Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, looking at Revelations chapter 1. That's right, we're teaching out of the book of Revelations over here at Coach in the Fight, Hermes Academy. Now we've done several classes already in the book of Revelations, you can see here on the screen. And you have to forgive me for saying Revelations instead of Revelation. It is a habit and you guys call me out on it all the time. I do work on it, but I do still make those errors. So please forgive me. I say that in advance because I know I'm going to say Revelations 37 times while making this video. But we're looking here at the classes that we have done in the book of Revelation. I point these out because I plan to go through and do a class in every chapter of the book of Revelation. But before we get all of those classes out, you have chances to go over and look at the classes that we've already done in the book of Revelation. Um, we've done a lot of classes related to the 144,000 and the Antichrist, which touches on the book of Revelation. The virginity of the 144,000 was a pretty popular class. In this class here, we went through and looked at the table or the diagram given by Clarence Larkin and used it as a backdrop as we stepped through the entire book of Revelation. So that's a pretty good class if you want to know the overall big picture. But if you look over at these two classes that we did for Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, we broke those down um, one video per class as we stepped through the seven churches. So if you want to know who those seven churches are, you can jump over and check out those classes. At some point, I'll probably create a playlist for all of the classes that we've done out of the book of Revelation. There's the other one that we did out of the book of Revelation. You could go ahead and check that one out. But in this one, I was wanting to get in and go in and do a class on chapter 8 of the book of Revelation as we're looking at the third temple, New Jerusalem. Uh, the New Covenant, we believe that there's a lot of information out of chapter 8 that pertains to that kind of stuff. But as I was thinking about jumping over there and do it, you know, I said, well, I had planned on doing the entire book, but I haven't done chapter 1 yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in and I'm going to look at chapter 1 in this class. We're going to cover the whole chapter in this class verse by verse, line by line, but I'm going to do it with a little bit of help from the Aramaic English translation of the Bible as well as the King James Version of the Bible. Now, some of you guys may know that the New Testament was not written in English. It was not even written in Greek. It was actually written in Aramaic. You have to watch those guys that's really into replacement theology because they want to replace the original text that was written in Hebrew and Aramaic and act like it was written in Greek and Latin. It was not. And when you jump in and you look at the original text in the Aramaic, you notice uh, subtle and sometimes not so subtle differences in the text. When you compare the Aramaic with the King James Version of the Bible. So that's what we're going to do in here. I've copied both the Aramaic and the King James Version into this Word document here and painstakingly lined them up so we can see verse by verse as we step down through here. Let me go ahead and increase the font a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. And let's run down through here. Now what I plan to do, Lord willing, I've said my prayers before I got started, but what I believe that I want to do is do the class from the King James Version of the Bible, which I'm used to, but then I want to go over and check the translation from the Aramaic to see if there are any significant differences besides the obvious ones. And that's where instead of saying Jesus Christ, the Messiah is being called Yeshua Mashiach. Now, I'm not the greatest at pronouncing these Hebrew words or these Aramaic words. I grew up in the King James Version. So you guys bear with me with that as well. I'm going to say Revelations 27 times 
and I'm going to say Jesus a hundred times and I'm going to mess up these Yahushua or this Yeshua Mashiach. I'm going to mess that up just about every time. But let's step down through here and let's just look at the words in English and do the best that we can. Look at, at Revelation chapter 1. On second thought, guys, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read from the Aramaic because I haven't done that yet. I haven't even read through the Aramaic altogether. And I promise you, I've read Revelations chapter 1 in the King James Version a hundred times or better. So just for grins and giggles, let's jump down through the Aramaic as we step down through this class. All right. So I guess for that, we have to get these pronunciations right. First one says, Yeshua the Mashiach, which Elohim gave to him to show to his servants the things that must shortly occur. And he signified it by sending through his messenger to his servant, Yochanan. Without going into much detail on the pronunciation of the Messiah's name, this is getting closer to the Hebrew and I do understand there's going to be people down in the comment section talking about the name of the Messiah. And yes, that name still has power. We do speak English and Jesus is definitely an English word. But I believe it is important at least to understand the Hebrew word or the Aramaic word just so we know we're speaking about the same guy. Now, you see this word Elohim here in replacement of God over there. Now, this is important to understand because when the Bible was originally written, there was no gods in the Bible. But the thing about that word Elohim, not only does it, does it refer to God, but it refers to angels. It refers to just about anybody in the spirit world. It's actually a plural name from what I understand, but I'm no expert. You guys that are, you can jump down in the comment section and correct me as you will. I'm going to move on. You see this part down here where it says he sent through his messenger. Now, that's going to be an angel, of course. And that's how the Messiah is talking to John or Yochanan through this angel. Verse 2 says, who bore witness to the word of Elohim and to the testimony of Yehoshua HaMashiach as to all that he saw. Now, I know I pronounced that incorrectly, but just for the sake of flow. That's the way I'm kind of used to pronouncing it. Yehoshua HaMashiach with a kind of an H in there. So you guys forgive me for that. I'm not an expert on the language. I keep trying to tell you guys that. I know a little bit about this book. But I don't know much about the words that's in the book. If that makes any sense. Blessed is he that reads. And they who hear the words of this prophecy. And keep the things that are written in it. For the time is near. Now, this could possibly be the first bit of real information that I'm going to give you guys. And that is this verse right here where it says, blessed is he that reads and he who hears the words of this prophecy. This is truly a blessing. Now, many of you guys know I have an engineering degree, a master of science degree. So I understand experiments. I do know how to do an, an, an experiment and I have experimented with these verses here and how I have both read it and I have read it to others and watched the blessings flow both ways. The, the people who read this book and the ones who hear this book will receive physical, undeniable, even almost tangible blessings by doing so. This is a real deal that he's talking about here. So I say that to say, you know, after you watch this video, go ahead and read the whole book. It takes about an hour and a half to read the entire book. You will receive blessings for doing so. Now notice this part right here says, for the time is near. Now, of course, this book was written almost 2000 years ago, but you have to understand that the Bible didn't come out in a language that we can understand until 1611. And I believe our father, who is omnipresent, actually knew that he actually knew that, you know, many or most people would not have a chance to read the book of Revelation until about 1611 and thereafter and so that's what he was talking about that's how he put in the book that the time was near he was talking to us who are reading it now 
It says, from Yochanan to the seven assemblies which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits which are before his throne. What he's talking about is the seven spirits here. Now, like we talked about before, we've done classes on the book of Revelation chapter 2 and a separate class for chapter 3 where we looked at those seven spirits, the seven churches. Over here is called the seven assemblies. These are seven different personalities of the Father's church. Each one of us are in one of those churches if we are the children of God we are in one of those churches and he's going to uh, call them out here in a minute and we'll address who they are in a second but remember as you read this book that the purpose of this book was for the, the, uh, the members of those different assemblies it wasn't really written for the entire world it was really only really written for the disciples of Christ if that makes any sense verse 5 says and from Yahuwah the Mashiach the witness the faithful the firstborn of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth who has loved us and released us from our sins by his blood now this was why I wanted to do this class over here is to bring out some of these parts of the Bible that we may be missing like right here where it talks about release us from our sins by his blood see people they want to try to understand how the F Messiah uh, died for our sins but when you're listening to a lot of people talk on that subject you really understand that they really don't know how in fact he did that to understand how he died for our sins, you have to go back to the Passover supper when he was doing the communion and he gave them the, the wine to drink and said that that was his blood. That is a communion feast that we are supposed to partake in every Passover in order to have our sins cleansed away. When we are baptized the first time, we get our previous sins washed away. Everything that we had done up until that point, we are we get a clean slate at our first baptism. But of course, no human is perfect and we, and we make errors or transgressions of the covenant all throughout the year. And our father in his infinite wisdom, knowing that we were going to sin which is the transgression of the law that we were going to send throughout the year. He gave us this provision. He gave us the Messiah's blood by way of the communion wine to wash away our sins. You know, like we talked about a little bit earlier about replacement theology, where these guys have replaced the way that the Messiah intended for our sins to be washed away with their own idea of how it should work you know some of them think you should believe hard enough or some say you should say a special kind of prayer or something like that to get your sins washed away that's the replacement theology because the father he intended for our sins to be wiped away first of all through that baptism and then yearly through that communion wine that we take during Passover Okay, now notice this part up here where it talks about the firstborn of the dead. Now, the King James Version says first begotten of the dead, but it is talking about how the Messiah was the first person to be reincarnated or to be resurrected from the dead. Of course, none of us are really expecting to be resurrected. Resurrection means the reincarnation of the spirit. We do understand that now. You have to understand that the Catholic Church changed our Bible and went in and took out every reference to the word reincarnation and replaced it with resurrection. That's why we are expecting dead bodies to come up out of the grave. People are talking about a zombie apocalypse and buying all kinds of ammunition, expecting these dead bodies to come up out of the grave. It's because the Catholic Church like I said took out the word reincarnation 
which is talking about our spirits coming back to life and replace that with resurrection, which is talking about our bodies coming back to life. Big, huge difference, guys. But but that goes along with the whole replacement theology. They replace everything. The thing about replacement theology, they replace everything. Everything has been replaced. Notice how it says that the Messiah was the witness. And that's what he was doing. You remember his first message to us when he came down here was that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. That was witnessing to us, letting us know that we all can partake in the kingdom of heaven. We just have to understand the covenant in order to do so. We have to get back within the law. That covenant that's talked about is over there in Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23. That's four chapters. We teach about it all the time on our channel. Subscribe and hit that bell notifications button so you can get those classes that we put those out. But we're always putting out those classes because we understand that it is that covenant and our obedience to that covenant that's going to help us survive this tribulation. Don't. Don't be confused by that Left Behind series over there, guys. I got to look at that thing for the first time yesterday, and I'll say that's just a movie. That is a very fictitious movie. I'll say that there was nothing that was in that movie that actually lined up with the scripture. That was all fiction. Don't be believing that, you know, that's real or nothing. i say again, it's just a movie. But it works well for those into replacement theology because now they've basically replaced the whole biblical truth. They've replaced the whole father's message with this left behind religion that they have formed around it. But let's go on. Chapter six says and has made us a kingdom of priests to Elohim, the father to whom be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now, this is why I wanted to do this. This is a significant difference right here. It when I was reading it over here in the Aramaic, for the first time, I remind you, it kind of rung out in my head that uh, that ain't what the King James Version says. King James Version says it's going to make us kings and priests. Kings and priests. You hear people say this all the time, that we're going to be kings and priests. But I promise you that this Aramaic over here is a more accurate translation of the scripture. Like I am a King James person. I've always been I've always read the King James version of the Bible even back to day one. I had to put a new international version beside my King James version as I read the book of Proverbs verse by verse. I had to read one verse in the King James and then I immediately had to jump over to the new international and try to get an understanding of what it was talking about. But by the time I got to the end of the book of Proverbs, I didn't need that new international book anymore. I understood all of those these thou's and all of the other King's English and I was able to read the King James Version, and I've been reading the King James Version ever since. That was over 30 years ago. But I do understand that the Aramaic is a more accurate translation, just like the Septuagint is. The Septuagint, when it comes to the Old Testament of the Bible, if you really want to dig and do some serious Bible study, you're going to have to whip out your Septuagint for the King James Version, and you're going to have to whip out your Aramaic for the New Testament because you see differences like this which I believe makes a difference you see over here it says kingdom of priests not kings and priests but a kingdom of priests we're talking about the kingdom age we're talking about the millennial age that thousand year period where the father comes down and takes reign over the earth you remember that Satan has always ruled the earth all the way back to when Adam and Eve made a covenant with him there in the Garden of Eden. He has had power over the earth. He has been the king of the earth. Well, that's actually going to change here during this tribulation. And after the tribulation, our father who created us is actually going to be the kingdom, is actually going to be the king of the earth for the first time. And in that kingdom, we're going to be we're going to be priests. We're not going to be kings. We're going to be priests. I'm slowing down on this because this is big. Even this, this is big for me, guys. Like I said, I've read this book over a hundred times, maybe two hundred times, and this is the first time I'm realizing that we're not going to be kings. We're just going to be priests. That's a big deal, guys. But let's go on. 
Behold, he comes with clouds and all eyes will see him and also they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn on account of him. Yes, amen. All right. Now, this is a misunderstood part of the scripture. I don't want to get into this too detail, but remember the replacement theology guys have replaced what this means over here. He's talking about the consciousness cloud, but those guys who are into that left behind series are thinking real clouds. I guess they're looking up at the sky at them fluffy pillows of H2 up there, H2O up there looking for bodies to be hanging out. That's a movie, guys. I say it again. That ain't nothing but a movie. The cloud she's talking about is the consciousness cloud. That's how he says, and all eyes will see him. All eyes is because that consciousness cloud is within us. We're going to be able to see him from within. We're going to be able to feel his presence. And every one of us is going to be able to do that. That's how people are trying to figure out how in the world is everybody in the planet going to be able to see the Messiah at his return at one time. They're thinking stuff like Internet. They're thinking stuff like television. You need to be thinking stuff like your conscious and your third eye. That's how we're all going to be able to see him. He's going to be inside. He's going to be, we're going to be able to see him from the inside. And also they who pierced him. This is, again, referring to reincarnation here, guys. Those same individuals that was there and pierced the Messiah trying to see if he was dead or not. Those individuals who doubted who he was are going to be reincarnated into this time. And they're actually going to witness his second coming. They didn't get it right at his first coming. They're going to get another chance to get it right at his second coming. We all were there in some form or fashion. That's why we love his word so much. That's why we're trying to find truths in his word is because we were there and we have now been reincarnated to be here. But you have to remember there was more doubtful people there during that time. Well, there are more doubtful people here and now too as well. But they too, just like 2,000 years ago, they will too be convinced at this time that's being talked about and all the tribes of the earth will mourn on account of him this is talking about spiritual Israel here and probably as well as traditional Israel bloodline Israel and probably all Israel will hear him at his coming it's supposed to be like a bolt of lightning coming across the sky but the thing about it, this event that's talking about here is the same event you see over there in the book of Daniel chapter 12 and in other places where it talks about how some will rise to remorse and some will rise to shame. This is talking about the great awakening. This is talking about the third temple. This is talking about when the, the covenant is built on our hearts. See. The tribes now are out here enjoying this Babylonian Egyptian culture that we live in. Everybody is pretty much living in sin and taking advantage of our free will. But when this day comes, when our conscience is awakened, when all of us see him on this consciousness cloud, many of us are going to be in a state of remorse and a lot of us are going to be in a state of shame. Those sound similar, but they are... Those sound similar, but they are different. Remorse and shame are not the same. I am Alep. Also, Tao says the master Adonai Elohim, who is and was and is to come. Ahaya, Ashur, Ahaya, the omnipotent. Okay, now I'm no now I have no idea what these parenthetical words are in here. I'm just gonna skip over that. But if you notice up here, instead of calling out this four letters of the Tetragrammaton, I call them Adonai. That's because of a class I just recently watched that taught me how these words were actually supposed to be pronounced. Um it never really was supposed to be Jehovah or Yehovah. That was kind of what we did in English. It was really supposed to point to Adonai. So whenever I see those, I try to say Adonai. 
you won't hear me say Jehovah or Jehovah or anything like that. Those are English words. It was basically when the Bible came out in English and they had added those vowels in there, people started pronouncing it as if it was a word. And then you look up here, it says, I am the Alep and the Tau. Now this is important here, right? This is this is the Aramaic. And these letters that it's talking about here may be Aramaic words, but it's really pointing to the Hebrew words. That is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. These are actually the Hebrew symbols you see over there on our channel. This is Aleph and that's Tav. That's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The reason why I use these as a symbol for our channel is because they actually have biblical powers. If you read over there in the Testament of Solomon, you find out that these letters, if you actually write them down, they will actually stop an argument. If you see two people arguing or if you're arguing with somebody and you want to end that argument, you can write these two letters down, a left and top, and they're supposed to stop that argument. I have seen that work, guys. That's why I use them on my channel to stop people from arguing so much about the Word of God. You know, I ain't trying to interpret the Left Behind movie over here. I'm just reading stuff out of the Scripture, and it really shouldn't be in debate. The Bible should actually win all the time, and so I get me a little bit of help. From these letters over here. Let me go ahead and show you what that one's supposed to be. It's supposed to be like that. A uh, left and Tav. But those replacement theology guys. They got you thinking that it is Alpha and Omega. And those are actually Greek letters. That's Greek. Again. The scripture wasn't written in Greek guys. It wasn't it was written in Greek. Just like it was written in English. Somebody translated it over to Greek. Just like somebody else translated it over to English. Alright, see how that all Aramaic is using the word omnipotent? I guess that means the same thing as almighty. Verse 9 says, I, your channin, your brother, and partaker with you in the affliction and suffering that are in Yeshua the Mashiach, which is in the isle called Patmos, because of the word of Elohim, and because of the testimony of Yeshua the Mashiach. Now, this is a little bit of a difference here, too, because over here in the King James Version is saying tribulation. And we understand the tribulation to mean seven years. And so people are wondering, OK, well, John, how are you in the tribulation if you was actually over there on Patmos? Are you again referring to reincarnation? How did you know you would be reincarnated during the tribulation? Well, that's not what it's talking about. When you look over here in Aramaic, he's talking about the affliction. This is talking about the persecutions that we suffer well even before the tribulation ever gets here. That's a significant difference, I believe. It's at least a notable difference. That he says that he is in the affliction and the suffering. Every this is this is what he's referring to is how we all have to bear our cross. We all have to go through something. If we ever want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we're all going to have to go through something. I keep bringing up those replacement theology guys, those left behind guys. They don't believe they're supposed to go through anything. They believe that all they have to do is believe hard enough, go to church enough, maybe pray enough, and they're actually going to end up in heaven. Guys, that ain't true. We have to go through some affliction. We have to go through some suffering. That's why a lot of people are suffering right now. That's why bad things happen to good people is because we all have to suffer these afflictions and sufferings. And that's what John is telling us is that he is also with us. That's why he was on Patmos in the first place for the word of Elohim, for the word of God was he on Patmos. And because of his testimony, these days are coming. You know, we are still awaiting the tribulation, but that's pro prophesied to be one of the things that we'll have to go through in the tribulation is people will be persecuted for the testimony of Christ. And what that boils down to is what we were talking about earlier is how we are expecting this change in our consciousness where we're all going to be awakened, where we're going to feel the father from the inside on our conscious, you know, that remorse and shame deal we was talking about earlier. Well, there's going to be people in higher places, people in wicked places, uh, principalities, municipalities, 
and who are going to want us to try to deny that the Father is speaking to us from within. They're going to want to try to hang on to this new world order as long as they possibly can. And spiritualism is the enemy of the new world order. That's why they killed the Messiah in the first place. That's why they killed all of the disciples, Peter and Paul and all of those guys were beheaded by over there in Rome. That's why they even put Paul on Patmos because they don't want anybody to understand spiritualism. That's why many people try to tell you this is the covenant because that is the first step to become spiritualized individuals is to get back into the covenant. To get back into the law. That's what got us separated in the first place when our forefathers went into Egypt and they took on those Egyptian traditions and holidays and all of that kind of stuff. That sin that they started committing separated us from the Father and we have been separated ever since. Well, if we ever want to get back in tune with the Father, if we ever want to get back in communion with the Father, the first thing that we have to do is go over and pick up the covenant and start reading it and start getting into compliance with his laws and his instructions. And that's the testimony of Yahushua HaMashiach. And that's why John was on Patmos is because he was spreading that message. Praise the Lord for the lightning. We're going to keep on going. Verse 10 says, I was in the spirit on the day of our master Adonai. And I heard behind me a great voice as a shofar. And then this shofar down here, this is referring to the horns that the priest would blow. To signify feast days and Sabbath days and new moons and different things like that. And that's what's going on here. You see right there when he says he was in the spirit on the day of the master. Now this would be referring to the Sabbath day. See this is pointing to the Sabbath day. When you look over there in Ezekiel chapter 46 and 1. You see that the Sabbath day as well as the new moon day are very special days in relationship to our conscious or our relationship to the Father or His third temple or however you want to say it. It is during those times that the inner court is actually opened. Of course that inner courtyard is inside of us now. But this rule will still apply. It's opened on the Sabbath day or the Lord's day. And again it's also opened on the new moon day. This is the problem with that replacement theology stuff. You know people say we don't have to honor the Sabbath day. They're actually stealing our blessings from us. They don't even know it. You know. This is the time, the Sabbath day is the time that the inner court is supposed to be open. But of course, they're trying to teach us to reject the idea of keeping a Sabbath day. And so what happens to the inner court? You know, we're just trampling all over it. Verse 11 says, That which ye see, write in a book, and send it to the seven assemblies, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now these are the seven churches. These are the seven spirits that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Now let me show you this chart from Clarence Larkin's book, Dispensational Truth. And let me show you something real interesting in here related to these churches. Okay, so I wish I had a better way for you to see these guys, but each one of these churches means something to us. Each of us in our spiritual walk are at one point in one of these churches. Now, of course, they, of course, everybody wants to be down there in Philadelphia, which is the favorite church. But that's not always the case. Many or most of us are not in this favorite church. Throughout our faith walk, we end up in several of these other churches. I know I've been in just about every one of these churches. I can remember being in just about every one of these churches. Ephesus, that is the backslidden church. That's when you have left your first love. That mission that the Father gave you so many years ago, you put it aside for one reason or another, you end up in a backslidden state. The way you get out of that church is to... Remember what that responsibility was that you received from the father. Pick it up again and start to do it again. Then you have the church of Smyrna. That's the persecuted church. This is actually one of the good churches. Is actually You're actually doing good when you are in a persecuted state. I believe the father said in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the persecuted. 
Then you have the licentious church. This is the fornicating church. This is the church that likes the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug, who is teaching them church doctrine or replacement theology. Basically, you got to put those false prophets away from you. You got to get away from to those. You got to get away from those prophets of Baal if you ever want to get out of that church. Then you have Thyatira Church. This one right here is the Lax Church. This one, you'll find yourself in this church. This, this is basically breaking the second commandment. If you're allowing people to do so, or if you're doing so yourself, you're going to find yourself in that church of Thyatira. It's a little bit tough to get out of that one. He even gives you a caveat for those who will never make it out of that. He tells them if you don't uh, know the depths of Satan or something like that. I'm in memory space. I don't have the book open right now, so I'm just going off of memory right here, so bear with me. But then you have the dead church. That's the Sardis church. The dead church. This is those individuals that have basically uh, feel like they've been with the father so long that they have, uh, they're not really active. They're not really doing anything anymore. They still have the faith, you know, but they aren't really doing anything with that faith anymore. Like I said, we've done classes on this stuff. You can check those classes. Probably you'll see a link to it at the end of this video. Or look for a playlist. But make sure you subscribe to our channel because we, we put out classes like these all the time. And then, of course, you have the Church of Philadelphia. That is the favorite church. You basically don't want to get out of that church. You want to make sure nobody takes your crown. Just keep doing what you're doing if you're in that church. The thing about being in the favorite church, guys, is difficult to understand if you're in that favorite church. Especially if you have a materialistic mindset. If you're expecting to have a nice Lexus or a beautiful home or something like that. and You, look, you may be looking around. And your old busted shoes and your empty refrigerator feeling like you're not too favored. You got to understand what it means to be favored of the father, especially in this pre-tribulation era. Favorite to the father and favorite to man ain't the same thing. And the last one you have is the lukewarm church. If I remember correctly, he tells them to uh, buy of me gold, tried by the fire, uh, put on ISAV. And it was one more thing he told them to do. I can't remember what it was. I had to cheat it a little bit and jump over there and look at it. The other thing was white raiment. That means they're going to have to put on righteousness, basically get back in the covenant. It was the three things to get out of that church. But let's keep, let's go on. Verse 12 says, And I turned myself to look at the voice that talked with me. And when I had turned, I saw seven menorahs of gold. These are the candlesticks that the King James Version talks about. This is also what's talked about up there in verse 11. You'll, you'll, if you pay close attention, you'll see that it, these seven churches, these seven assemblies, make up the seven candlesticks. Verse 13 says, And in the midst of those menorahs, one like the Son of Man, clothed to the feet, and turned about in a robe reaching to his feet with a golden girdle. So it's going to give some detail on how he is dressed. Has on a long robe draped down to his feet. And he has about his paps a golden girdle. Verse 14 says, And his head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Now, this is really interesting too. When you look at the details here. Because I've always wondered about this part over here. In the King James Version where it says his hairs were white like wool. Wool ain't always white, guys. We, we grow sheep here on the Hillbilly Homestead. And we don't have a white one in the bunch. And so when I see this. In the text, it's talking about white like wool. I'm like, what are they talking about? Wool ain't white. But then when you look over here in the Aramaic, it says like white wool. That's a, that's a difference. It's a subtle difference, but it is a difference. See, over here in the King James Version, it's only really talking about the color of his hair. 
It says his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Then it goes on to talk about his eyes. But then over here in the Aramaic, it says, and his hair was white, like white wool, like snow. This is talking about the texture of his hair. So he has hair like wool, but that woolly hair is white. I'm sure some of you appreciate this more than others. And so we'll leave you with that to meditate on as we go on. And his eyes like a flame of fire. Verse 15 says, and his feet were like fine brass flaming in a furnace and his eyes and his voice like the sound of many waters. Also talking about his complexion there. And it says, and he had in his right hand seven stars and from his mouth issued a, a fervent spirit and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. OK, now this is a significant difference here, guys. You see those movie guys always trying to portray this as because the King James Version says out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword. But we see over here in the Aramaic that from his mouth issued a fervent spirit. Now, how they got a two edged sword out of fervent spirit, I don't know. But I got but again, guys, I remind you, this Aramaic is a better translation. This is one of the books they would have used to come up with the King James Version. This was there before the Greek. This was there before the English. The Aramaic it was the start. This is what John wrote. He wrote in Aramaic. He didn't write in Greek just like he didn't write in English. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like one dead. And he laid his right hand upon me and said, fear not, I am the first and the last. Now, this is like what he was talking about up there when he said he was the Aleph Tav, when he says he was the Alpha and the Omega, when he says he was the Aleph and the Tau. The first and the last. This is the Messiah. This is our father. There's a couple of people on our channel who are confused about the whole Trinity thing. Because at one point they'll try to explain to me that Jesus is not God. And then they'll come back and denounce the Trinity. Which actually says that Jesus is not God. So they're saying, hey, the Trinity is not correct. And I'm like, true. True. The Trinity is not correct because Jesus is God. And then they'll come back and say, well, Jesus is not God. I'm like, man, you're confused. <laughs> Do you believe in the Trinity or not? You need to go back and study the Trinity to see what it is that you believe in. Do you believe that the Messiah is God or not? Or do you believe in the Trinity? One of the two. Do you believe that the Messiah is God or do you believe in the Trinity? One of the two. Pick one. Right here in verse 17 is telling us that the Messiah is God. This is one of the places that we see it, one of hundreds of places that we see that. The way it's telling us here is the Messiah is the first and the last. We understand that, that our father is the first being ever created in the universe. Now, I shouldn't have said created because he has always existed. He was never created. He has always existed. He was the first being at one point, he was the only being, but praise the Lord, he wanted to create us. And even after all of us are gone, he will still be here. That's what it's talking about, the first and the last, the Aleph and the Tav. And who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And you see how at the beginning of 18, you have a lowercase letter. You have a lowercase word that's telling you that this is actually the same sentence here. And so at one point, he's saying that he is God as the first and the last. And then simply separated by a semicolon there. He's saying that he was dead and resurrected as the Christ. This is all saying that the Messiah is our father. The father and the Messiah is one. It says that all over the place, including 
the book of John chapter 1 verse 1 but it says I who lives and was dead and behold I am alive forever and ever amen and I have the keys of death and of the unseen world now this is interesting because when you look over in the King James Version it says hell well, somebody ought to do a search in the Aramaic and see, does the Aramaic use the word hell? Or is it talking about the unseen world? See, we understand, we have the third testament of the Bible now, guys. We understand what hell is like. What we've been taught in the churches in regards to hell is all wrong. They got that one completely wrong, like they got it out of that Left Behind movie or something. That is the spirit world. When we die, we go into the spirit world, the unseen world. You ever heard of a ghost? Well, if we're not careful, if we don't do what it is that we're supposed to do here on this planet and we die, we're actually going to go into a state of darkness and confusion and be wandering spirits walking around here like ghosts in this unseen world in the spirit world it's not really hell because there is no fire there and there is no devil there it's not even down there but we'll save that for another class looking at verse 19 it says therefore write what you have seen and the things that are and the things that are to be after this this is talking to John Telling him how he's about to deliver him this book of Revelation. And I think I've been doing pretty good with that word. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 20 says, And the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven menorahs of gold, those seven stars are the messengers of the seven assemblies, and the seven menorahs are the seven assemblies. So here is, Another revelation talking about those churches up there and how they make up the seven assemblies or the seven churches. Those are the seven menorahs that stood behind the son of God up there. And then the seven stars that he had in his hand. Those are the seven angels that are over those churches. You have to remember, guys, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers. Humanity right now are con controlled by angels guys there's a lot of people that don't want to admit that or don't want to realize that but that don't matter <laughs> still true we are controlled by angels right now these messengers these seven stars that he's talking about actually control us as we enter in and out of those seven churches that were talked about up there in the previous verse and over there in chapter 2 and chapter 3 all right, that's going to just about do it for chapter one. Like we said, we've already done classes on chapter two and chapter three. Looks like we'll do one on chapter four if we can hold off. We really want to get in to do a class on chapter eight. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell notification button so you can see when those classes come out. If you got something out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Leave us a comment below if you will. Share this video. All that does as well to help our little modest channel out and our little videos so we really appreciate it thank you very much and shalom